This is Coach's Corner. On each episode, we highlight one topic in endurance running, starting with a simple idea, and then discuss when it's true, false, or somewhere in between. Our purpose is to provide you with information that you can apply to your own training. Our four coaches are Ian Sharman, Chrissy Mel, David Roach, and me, Sean Bearden. So this is our last episode for 2019, and our theme for 2019 in terms of format for the show has been true-false, where each of the coaches then answers true or false, but then we discuss the nuances of, of those answers that really make them both or in between and their different circumstances. We're, we've kept that theme for 2019, and we're going to keep that today with each coach asking uh, a true or making a true-false statement. But next year in 2020, we're going to bring a new format. We'll keep you on the edges of your seats for that. Um, We'll announce that in our first episode of the new year. Hope everybody has a wonderful holiday. But we will start today with our final true falses and begin with a true false statement from David. Hey, everyone. Um, I love that we're doing a new format. This is probably a reference for the millennials in the audience, but it's like when Fortnite goes dark and then comes up with a whole new world. So that's going to be us next year. So my true faults for the for the coaches is training for a 200 mile or similar race is fundamentally different than training for other ultras. Um, so let's start with Ian. Um, that's a tough question. I would say it is not fundamentally different, but there are differences. So uh, the, the main thing being probably more back to back long runs, both to get the physical training in for it and also just the tactics and being able to try out all the gear, that kind of thing. But that doesn't mean that I would I would have someone tri- doing 10 hour runs again and again. So not that much different to if they were training for another type of ultra. I'd still have them doing long runs that are maybe four hours, five hours max, unless it's a race within practice. The main thing that would be different, I would say, is the types of races you might use in the buildup. Uh, for example, I wouldn't recommend someone doing it unless they've run a hundred miler, ideally several hundred milers. Uh, and that's not so much for the physical training, that's more for the practice of things like eating and drinking and the kind of things they're likely to go through within the race. So um, I'd say that the main difference is you just need probably more experience going into it. Uh, and the, the other big physical difference people are gonna go through is the fact that they're gonna be uh, needing to sleep within the race. And that's not something you can actually get better at through practicing small amounts of sleep or, or sleep deprivation of any kind. Instead, it's something where you're gonna kind of find out the first time you do it, how it works. Uh, and I know someone like Chrissy's gonna have a much better idea about this because she's actually gone through this while the other three of us have never personally done it themselves. But I've, I've had a few people I've coached for races like the Tour de Jean, in, which is 200 or so miles uh, in the Alps in Italy. Uh, also the 200 milers in, uh, in the US, like the Tahoe 200, I just had someone there. And typically the, the kind of training they need is they just can't get away with as little as they might be able to in some other ultra distances. Um, and there's just the more unknowns, basically, particularly with how sleep deprivation will work. And so they need to be using that skill set they've developed from 100 milers uh, to be able to then work out how they can problem solve. For example, do they think they're going to be getting 15 minute naps all the time? Are they going to be getting three hour naps once a night? To some degree, they're not going to know until they get into it. And there's not a whole lot they can practice with that. So it's trying to just learn that entire skill set with enough experience that then they can apply it in this new and harder scenario. So I would say it's not a, a fundamentally different way to train. You just need a bit more experience. Um, and, uh, and there's definitely going to be some new things that people go through in a 200 miler. I actually have not gone 200 miler, Ian. I haven't run that. Almost, (laughs) almost. Going around Tahoe is basically that. Tahoe was 165 and it was, I still almost, I would say I approached that very similarly to a hundred miler, even though it was a bit longer. Uh, my I was kind of on the cusp of true false and mostly because there's going to be different aspects of training, but the, I would say that they're not the same because of the mental training. I feel like there's a lot more strategy that comes in with 200 milers and not to say that there's not strategy and how you have to take care of yourself in any of the distances that were leading up to this point. When you get into the multi-day, you said a key one, I think uh, sleep deprivation, how do people manage multiple nights? having four days to accomplish this distance. Does somebody 
push through and try and get it done in a short amount of time as possible or maximize the time and get sleep each night. There's a lot of different strategy that goes into it. So I feel like the mental preparation, the mental training is, is very different than preparing for something less than 24 hours. I hate to admit it, but we can skip a night of sleep. We like, we kind of have to do it in our world sometime, but skipping four nights of sleep is a whole different ball game. And I, yeah, the mental training. And you, you touched on a lot of great stuff with the physical training and the back to backs and like how you would use your race prep, all the lead up to that. I totally agree with the physical training of that. So my, my focus in was the mental training for getting ready for something that much different. Yeah. Sean, you're yeah. My, I, and I say true to this as well, that they are different. Um, I'll come around to that word fundamentally different. Cause I think that that's important, but I do think we, we do a disservice often to ultra runners when we, when we present training of, of ultra marathons, the same as if all ultra distances are the same, you know, they're not. Um, and a 200 mile event is very different from one that's 50% or 25 or 15% of the distance. All of those percentages would still work out to be ultra marathons. Um, and, and in the same way, we can't define a race or the, the type of training needed simply by the distance itself, right? So the, the Moab 240 endurance run is, is certainly a challenging event, but it's set in Utah, it's in October, and it's less than 30,000 feet of vertical gain overall. It's completely different from what Ian mentioned, the 205-mile Tour de Gion in September in the Italian Alps, nearly 90,000 feet of vertical gain, and nearly 30, about 31 miles between major uh, aid station bases. So it, it's really not the distance that makes training for one race fundamentally different from another, but rather the, like the capacities, the abilities required to be successful in the event. So if we take somewhat similar races that differ mostly in just the distance, like say the Zion 100 and the Moab 240, then yeah, I think the difference in distance does make training for those events different, but perhaps not fundamentally different um, which was in the, in the statement. So I, I think both require much more stamina than a 50K and a 50-mile event on the same terrain, and both require the the ability to deal with the psychology, as Chrissy was mentioning, of nighttime, of extreme fatigue, physical and mental. But they really differ from each other a lot. And for me, it'd be the slightly greater emphasis early in the training buildup to muscular endurance for the 100-mile um, and larger interval loads as the race race comes on. Um, then training for the, for something like a 200 or the Moab 240 in the same terrain, where for me, speed walking and more double days, two in one day workouts would be in the plan. Um, yeah, so that's so cool. Like, so I think one thing we're seeing a lot is that a lot of people are doing these for the first time and they're going in pretty cold, you know, because there's not that much research in this area and there's not like anything settled about how to do it. Um, and so like if someone, let's say they're doing the Moab 240 is their first well, like one of these types of races, um, and they have it next year, what would you say to them is like, let's say like the one most important thing or, or something for them to really think about if they've, let's say completed a, you know, a hundred K or a hundred mile or, and that's it. Like they're just going into this and trying to see what they can do. Like, what would you tell them they should prepare for? And let's start the same way. So, Ian. I, I would say, like Chrissy pointed out, it's going to be much more about the mental side. Um, you can get as fit as possible. You can be Olympic levels of fitness, but if you've not got the mental side there, you're, you're not going to be able to force yourself through feeling tired, feeling sore, and just being out there for that much longer. I mean, think about even uh, a single day ultra where you might be suffering and you've got six hours left or 10 hours left or something. In this, you might have three days left. And just the enormity of that is huge. So I just say a lot of it is about just preparing yourself mentally for what you're really going to go through and just being uh, very uh, realistic about how much dif more difficult that might be and how important it'll be to have a, a really strong why. So is if that, you don't, you go. Oh, is that mental work that you're talking about done on the trails or off primarily? Like, are you saying like, think about these things off and really get that down? Or is it more like, something that you want people doing during the running? 
I would say both so visualization in, the, in a run. I tell people, imagine this was near the end of the race. Like if it's a hundred mile, imagine you're at mile 90. How would you be switching between running and hiking? How do you expect to feel? What do you think the, uh, the weather and the night and day will be like? Just so they're thinking through that and they can be better prepared for it. But a lot of it, I think, is about the kind of sitting down there, uh, looking out the window and going, wow, 200 miles. That sounds amazing. Or watching a video of someone doing one of these races and getting hugely inspired so that when they get deep in the race, they can call that back up again and say, this is why I'm doing this. And I think without that, doesn't matter how fit you are, you're not going to get through it. Every single person that finishes these races has to grind. And I think in a lot of other ultra distances, uh, particularly below 100 miles, grinding isn't necessarily part of the race. It usually is, but it isn't necessarily, or it might be for a much shorter time. In this, you've basically got days of grinding, where by that I mean you're just you know, doing a lot of walking, everything already hurts and you're just kind of wanting it to be over. So you've got to have a, a very strong reason behind why you keep moving forward. That's amazing. Chrissy, what are you thinking? When you were saying the mental prep side again, uh, and you're talking about like sitting out the window and looking versus, and then I'm totally hundred percent when you're doing training runs and maybe you don't feel so great, like using that as a time to like, okay, how do I want to feel at mile 80 of a hundred? So, what am I going to do to get through this? Or if I'm feeling great, and but I've got a little, you know, I've got the miles built up in my legs, putting myself in that place in the race. The one thing about staring at the window, I'm much more of a spreadsheet girl. So I would encourage people to kind of come up with a plan, like spend some time, um, like detailing out my Tahoe rim trail was this color coordinated all sorts of spreadsheet, like um, cells filled with what I would want at different aid stations and have this best set plan but then like the moment of like humble or vulnerability is handing the plan over to whoever's going to be involved with you or if it's just you on race day and saying, and this could all change and be really uh, understanding of the why we do ultras and how it just kind of throws us through a loop sometimes and we might have the best plan and it's something to come back to, but knowing that it might be just that, something to come back to, we might have to be able to roll in the moment with what's going on. So again, like that mental prep, you called it grinding, just what is it that gets your head around all the changes and challenges that might come up while you're out there for three, four days, depending on how long you plan to do it. Wow. Um, so Sean, like any like training, things that you want you would think that would be good takeaways for people that might be thinking about this for me the the athletes that i've coached for the tour de Gion and for uh, for multi-day like week-long or longer fkt attempts things like that the main difference that i use with them in training is to try to promote both physically and mentally the idea that being on your feet and moving consistently is now is now the baseline you know this is this is life now that's baseline and so what we introduce is a lot of multiple workouts per day so they may go an hour and a half in the morning two hours at lunch two hours in the evening rather than trying to do one big long day even if it's like a saturday when they're not working but it's just making sure that the body recognizes we may have a little bit of downtime but we're constantly getting going again constantly getting going again and I think that works for both body and, and mind. Awesome. I think we're ready for the next question. Sure. So this one's from me. This is uh, my question, true or false. The faster you are at flat running, the better you can run uphill. So uh, we'll start off with Chrissy. Uh, I would say false on that. And I would almost, I would say the reverse is true. Running on uphills can help you on your flats. I, uh, I had this, uh, thought of this run that I did in the Grand Canyon uh, at Yanko and she had been training for the World 100K and I had been training for a big mountain event and those two big climbs getting in and out of that ditch it was very distinct on where our strengths were that day and I think the I was able to hang with her on the flat pole along those you know, 14 miles back to the river where getting to the hills it was it was noticeable for her like that her training was on flat ground. So I feel like there's different efficiencies for each and the transfer from the efficiency 
deficiencies that we find in flat running don't necessarily transfer to when the hill grade pitches up. Granted, like everything, there's different um, variations. So what is the hill grade? You know, are we talking mountain climbing where we're hands on knees trying to power up something? Or is it a runnable grade that, you know, what I'm looking at out my driveway here? So it, it could transfer a little bit better, but I would say, you know, arguably the, the flat fast versus the steep mountain fast flat running would not transfer as well to the hills as vice versa. But I'm really curious to hear what everybody else has to say about it. I didn't Me want to too. go That's it. why I asked. <laughs> so, uh, Sean. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to echo a little bit of what Chrissy said there. Um, I think from a popul in a population standpoint, the, the answer is true. So if we take like, say everybody in the Boston Marathon, the first 50 finishers, the middle 50 and the last 50, they're probably going to do the same on say running up a 6% grade for a long distance. The first 50 will be the first 50 and the last 50 will be the last 50. But on an individual basis, and really I think this is where this this is going, this statement, on an individual basis, I'm gonna say false. Um, as uphill incline increases, muscles like our gluteals are engaged much more, which are also engaged in faster running. We, and we say, as Chrissy said, that, that hill running is speed training in disguise, and, and that's one of the reasons. It, so the opposite idea that speed training is hill running in disguise may have some merit, but there are important differences in the physiology of the thing, in, in the elastic um, and the metabolic contributions to running on level versus incline that really aren't equivalent. So the energy that goes into, this is from some of the research been, that's been done, the energy that goes into breaking into horizontal propulsion declines or goes down as the grade increases and the cost of lifting the body vertically increases as the grade increases. So we're shifting where the requirements are. So the cost of running uphill can't be calculated for any specific person based on their cost of running on level ground. The, the two diverge. Um, and so generally being faster on flat running will mean that you are better at running on low and moderate inclines. I think that's true of the Boston Marathon runners example, but I think that the crossover benefit diminishes as the incline increases. And so for a trained endurance runner, the relatively small gains of, a, of achievable flat running speed um, probably don't contribute appreciably to, to uphill performance gains. Okay. And what about you, David? So I'm going to go the exact opposite answer and say a very strong true on this one, um, and which is rare for me. I think I usually am like on board with everything else. That so I'll start with where Sean finished about. So a lot of studies show that level ground running economy and uphill running economy correlate, and so that's like taken as a given. Makes sense. Those are generally shallower grades. That relationship obviously will start to um, become less strong around like you know, above 10%, 15%, that sort of thing. But basically the idea is if you're good at level ground, you're good at uphills and vice versa. Um, and what Sean said about they have, meanwhile, they do have slightly different biomechanics. So the weird part of all this is that even though they involve slightly different biomechanics, there's pretty strong cross correlation. And the idea being with the researchers, most of the ones that I read say is that like, basically, as long as you're running and you're not just like, maybe in Florida or running on a treadmill at 0% all the time, it doesn't take much to get the adaptations to cross over from uphill and downhill. Um, so with that in mind, what I look at is, okay, well, clearly if you get a little better at hills, you're probably gonna get a little faster as long as you can um, handle the extra speed of it. And if you get a little bit better at flats, you're probably gonna get a little better at uphills because as long as you can handle the biomechanical loading of it. Um, the question is what happens long-term? And so my guess, and this is, obviously just a theory, is that we do have evidence of people improving their level ground running economy long term with a focus on that. That's basically every single Olympic pro athlete you've ever seen that progresses past the age of 22, like their VO2 max isn't going up anymore. What they're improving is their running economy um, on level ground. And most likely, based on the research, their uphill running economy would improve too. Um, the question is if the reverse could happen. If uphill it, improving uphill solely could then get you that much better at uphills and flats. And my theory for that is probably not. My guess is that you're limited by some things when you're just training uphill that you're not limited on flats. So a lot of that's to say, you know, let's go look at the, at the evidence we have now, like the applied evidence, 
and maybe the World Mountain Running Championships this past weekend being the best example. This is where the margins are slim, and we're starting to really see the limits of human performance. Um, man winner, male winner, Joe Gray, you know, 28-minute 10K runner. Female winner, in, just started trail running. Almost, you know, very little experience on uphills was Grayson Murphy, an absolute uh, beast of a runner on flats, um, who came and it applied immediately to uphills. And my guess is the reverse wouldn't hold true. So... This is all a long-winded way of saying that, um, you know, both are important, but if you improve your speed, um, you're almost certainly going to become a better climber. And that's probably the way to optimize long-term ability um, at that thing, in my opinion. That, that's all fascinating, guys. And, and that's why I want to ask that, because there's clearly an overlap, like Sean said, where <laughs> if you're a two-hour marathoner, you're probably going to be quicker uphill than a four-hour marathoner. That's fairly obvious. But that applies to any element of, of their running. So it's how much of that is varying on an individual basis that, that, that certainly fascinates me. So um, I, I would say, you know, that that's answered the, the general part of my, my question. The other thing would be how how should people focus on that more if they're um, if they're wanting to improve one or the other? Should they bias it more? Obviously, the specificity that comes into it, but how much should they be thinking about how they may differ from someone who's equally as fast as them on how much they do? I mean, do you think there's a lot of individual variation there? Uh, so let's go back to, to just kind of round it off with uh, starting with Chrissy again. Hey, David, can you go first on this one? Well, let's go to, to Sean while, while Chrissy's uh, dealing with dog things. Sure. Um, so, you know, I come back to this this recognition in, in the data that uh, at least from for elite endurance mountain runners, the uphill cost of running is not associated with level cost of running. And so just as you said, and I, and I agree with David on a population level that generally the people with better running economy on flats have generally better running economy on the uphills. But when we dig into the data and you look at individuals the individual's cost of running on level ground and then that, that same person's cost of running on an incline, some people have this relatively similar values. Some people have much very different values. So there isn't th that good relationship. So when it comes back to training, then I think that that we, we come back to, to specificity. If you're, if you're going to be um, doing your races on flatter terrain, that's where you should be trying to build your speed. If you're trying to, if you're working for races that are going to have a lot of vertical gain, then you need to be doing a significant amount of, of work there while still maintaining your overall abilities, you know, at all speeds. So it doesn't mean you only go in the mountains, but uh, flat running, I don't, I don't know of any evidence that says that being able to increase your flat running speed a little bit is going to translate into better uphill running. I suppose part of what I was getting at there as well is, uh, let's say you have two people like Joe Gray, two 28-minute 10K runners. How do we know which one's going to be better at uphill running? Uh, if they're doing the same training, is there some, like, they have a bigger butt? Or, you know, what, what, what thing might it be? I don't know. Yeah, look at their butt. That would be a great study. <laughs> um, I Well, I think you you ha you you have to compare apples to apples and make sure that you're comparing them on uphill so that their their stamina for uphill um, in an uphill race, for example, their ability is an uphill race. So you, you can't compare marathon times between two people um, that are very similar otherwise and from that predict who, who's going to do better in an uphill race. So um, I think we have a real world lab here, which are actual results, you know, um, and Matt, let's say the Mount Washington road race being possibly the maybe the the best example of pure uphill running since that's pretty steep i think i'm not sure the exact grade but i think it's you know 10 to 14 percent or something for seven miles um and throughout history the people that perform best at it are the ones that are fastest even within individual individuals so when individuals are at their fastest they perform their best there a good example being maybe stage candidate who came and absolutely took that race by storm right off of his fastest training um, and since has not, you know, he's still crushing it because he's one of the best runners ever, but, you know, is not quite at that thing. And then we'll see that across a bunch of different people that, you know, they'll perform best. Granted, that's on a road, but it is a pure climbing test. And um, so I think it probably I think what we're probably getting at is that there's a 
hypervariance among individuals and how each person responds. So my guess is that athletes that are over 40 or 35 might respond better to the specificity element than athletes that can truly optimize their speed. So let's say two women, let's say one woman can either be a 37 minute 10 K runner that is, um, just focuses a lot on Hills. And that same woman could be a 34, 30, 10 K runner, a 35 minute 10 K runner that mostly trains on flats, but does a couple of trail runs. My guess is that that, that person, the faster person would win the uphill races, but obviously that's a straw man that can't be recruited. So, um, it's not very helpful, but that's, that's my, my general approach with it. But I think again, most likely if you're listening to this, you know, have a general feel like when you were your fastest, were you your best climber and what was your training focus at that point? Um, so I would say dial in a little bit on that, but yeah, I'd love to hear what Chrissy has to say. Thank you for that. Sorry about the interruption with my PD pup going off. Um, I would just echo the word specificity. That's what I came back to Sean talking about. And I feel like that's the, the main one that I focus in on with people. And I don't necessarily, I'm not um, like the total elite, like the top level. I'm, I'm thinking of it more of like a broad range of everybody. Like what's the, like the general goal. And so if it's an event that has a lot of climbing, you should get into that. Uh, the race that I put on the check and I, that has both. And that's actually been a really fun event to watch. Like who's going to, who's going to rock it here, the, you know, the 218 marathoner or the guy that won Western States last year, like watching those two strengths come out um, and how the specificity plays out for either one. So I, yeah, I just I'm not really adding more other than just um, if you're getting into what you're doing for training, you're trying to maximize what you can get out of it. What is your goal and train for that? Like, I guess the one other thing I would throw in there is like what you have available to you. So if somebody lives in the flatlands and they want to train for hard rock, then yeah, you want to work on your speed and get as fit as possible on the train that you have available to you. And then if you can get in some specificity training, like heading out to the hard rock course and working on your climbing or something. So I guess there is that piece of what do you have available to you and just do the best you can with what you've got and train for it. Anyways. Yeah. Thank you. I suppose I would add one thing which is slightly off from that, which is just that uh, the faster you are at flat running, you are not quicker at, at hiking uphill. So that is different muscles that that definitely has. Who you have to specifically train for that. So if you have a well, you are a little bit quicker, admittedly, hiking uphill, but it doesn't have as much of a crossover as running uphill. So it, the example of a flat runner, someone who lives somewhere flat, training for hard rock you're going to have to do a lot of hiking on a treadmill, and doing a lot of flat speed work is not going to translate that much to hiking up. 25% gradients the whole time. But anyway, no, thank you, everyone. So, um, Chrissy, your true false. I'm steering away. From, I guess it still is relevant to training, but I, I get this all the time. And even in myself, when things come up, is my true false would be a runner should run through a tweak, but not an injury. And I had all this, all sorts of wording around it, but just to put it as a true false, a runner should run through a tweak, but not an injury. So, Sean, you go first. Okay. Yeah, true. True. I, I think it's a mistake to think of tweaks as infant injuries. That a tweak is a tweak, an injury is an injury. And it is true that sometimes tweaks are actually minor injuries or something that would lead to a bigger injury, but that's not always the case. And I think we often think of little tweaks that way. Having aches, pains, little twists, little strains, all of those things are are part of what comes along with owning a body, with being an organism. And we intentionally push that body, right, in familiar ways, but to unfamiliar magnitudes when we're training for ultras. So if a tweak increases in discomfort during a run, if it is uncomfortable when you're not stressing it, like when you're lying around or if it wakes you up at night, or if it alters your gait, or if it ultimately produces any signs and symptoms of injury, like heat and redness and swelling, then I think a run should be discontinued or, or you take a rest day or you don't begin it. But otherwise, um, tweaks are perfectly fine to continue moving through. Well, then David's up. Um, I mostly agree, but I'm going to say false just because I think that a lot of what we're getting into here are um, – 
the perils of self-evaluation for motivated personalities. Um, and that one of the things that we might be measuring when we say, okay, well, you know, I know I personally can run through tweaks, like, or, or sort of whatever you want to call it. I can run through them and I've almost never had a layoff. I think what we're probably measuring there is not like me being smart or whatever. We're probably just measuring my underlying genetics and background. Um, and meanwhile, other athletes, like, you know, every time they get a tweak of any type, like based on the like risk reward of it, it's always worth just taking a few days off. Um, given what they've gone experienced and probably, um, some of what they've done. Like my wife is working for this company right now, um, called Axgen that does athletic injury testing where essentially they give you a feel for your, like how your genetics predict certain types of injury risk. It's super, um, you know, they're still learning a lot, but it is fascinating that there are, and it was validated at Western States this year, at least for bone injuries. It's fascinating. I mean, there, it's a strong genetic component independent of background and behavior. Um, and so, yeah, my guess is the my my I say false just because I want people to really focus on what your background is. If you never get injured, yeah, you can run through tweaks and soreness. And if you do have that experience in your past, three days is always fine. Like you're all the science says you don't lose any fitness in that time. Um, and taking three days off 10, 10 times a year, that just adds in a little bit of extra recovery. So um, that's my slight caveat to agreeing with everything that Sean said. And I agree overall as well there. So I would say, yes, a runner should generally run through a tweak, but not an injury. I would say there's, there's two elements to my answer. One of them is each run is going to have a different definition of what a tweak is. For one person, that means that their, you know, their bone is sticking through the leg. It's like, oh, it's nothing. It's like the uh, Monty Python sketch where it's just a scratch when his arms have been cut off. Uh, and other people will be, you know, they've got the tiniest head cold and they're going to think that they're on their deathbed. So a lot of it comes down to just knowing the runner of, of what would they think of as a valid excuse? Are they a hyper motivated person who's going to try and run through anything? Are they someone who's always looking for a reason to not run? And if it's, you know, below 60 degrees, it's too cold for them, that kind of thing. So I would say the, the way I would think of a tweak and the way that I treat it with uh, the high level concept and with my own running as well is that if it's something like Sean said, that uh, you don't have a visible injury there, there's no uh, swollen ankle, there's no uh, redness or anything like that, and it's the kind of thing that you feel like you can run on it, then there's no harm in trying to run. But you might find out after a mile that that's a bad idea, or it might go away after a mile. And so you've got to be able to have that flexibility during that run. Uh, in particular, it might be that you had, say, a speed session today, and so you dial it back to starting off at least as a recovery run, and then maybe turning it into a speed session if everything has faded away. So I, I, I think my answer comes down to just being very flexible, but not being a wimp and not just uh, using any old excuse to, to not do things. Yeah, that was the follow-up question I was going to say. I think you kind of hit on it, Ian, was like, how do you know? Like, that's the thing with that question is what's the definition of tweak versus injury? And I, I think it's really interesting that it really, again, always goes back to, like, individuals. Like, first on a personal level, does, like, how, how does that person interpret? Is it because of a head cold versus the, the different degrees that you just said? So, um, yeah, thanks, guys. I, I'm glad there's a little bit of both. Sorry to jump in. What would you say for that? Like, I, I know that that's breaking the rules, but um, I'm just curious. Like, given your experience with, you know, so many different types of athletes, like, like what do you say in that scenario? I'm definitely of the let's, let's get out and see what it is because a, a tweak to you and me might be different. I'll ask a lot of questions up front if, if a coaching client comes to me with that. Is that what you're asking, David? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So if um, they're coming and like, I did this and it feels this way. A lot of those questions, like, what does it feel like when you're not running? Does there any, any symptoms, visual symptoms? What does it feel like? Have you talked to another healthcare provider that actually that can maybe help you with diagnosis or whatever? Um, but yeah, starting off being more conservative in the next run, switching the training up a bit so that if there was a couple workouts coming, let's back those down. Even with a head cold, I would say, well, We'll back down the intensity a little bit because to me I'd rather put your energy towards getting over that cold that rather than prolonging it assuming that like a little bit of, of sweat will help you push it through as opposed to a workout tapping your resources so so maybe this is actually a little selfish to hijack but to like ask a hypothetical of you three that um, might have some real so like all my biggest regrets as a coach come from 
not immediately saying like, stop, like, you know, even when something seems like it's really small. So I think I'm a little, uh, like I'm a little cowardly when it comes to this as both an athlete and a coach, um, like in, in telling people I just rest, but so let's say an athlete has a big race coming, like, um, this, let's say it's this weekend, let's say it's this, this Saturday. And during the taper, they had a onset of rather sub, like rather serious pain in like an area that could be um, muscle, it could be bone, whatever. You know, like it's one of the, they go to a, a doctor, you don't know the quality of that person um, or the how much their person that's not that familiar with athletes that says, oh, it's probably uh, soft tissue, but we can't give you an MRI right now. And so they're in this position where it's like, okay, this is what I've been going for. Do I, and I could run through it probably, you know, it's a tough person. Like, what do you say in that scenario? Um, I mean, this might just be one of those things. You have to know the person, you have to know the doctor, you have like blah, blah, blah. But I wonder if there's anything that you guys think of in particular in your coaching experience. So maybe, um, since Chrissy asked the question, like Chrissy, do you have any feedback on that? You said you have to know the person. I, my thought was, is, I just know for myself and I always precursor this for the athlete is that, you know what, my goal for you is to have this be a part of your lifestyle and like the long-term vision. So does running through this one injury and this, this one race goal that we had or whatever um, the, the hypothetical led up to this point, like, does that reach this overall goal? And then also with them working on like, well, what is your overall goal? My overall goal is to have this as a long-term life thing. I will make choices that might, uh, take a risk in that moment to not achieve the, the short-term goal to achieve that long-term goal. And that might mean missing out on something really cool. And that could be all affecting out, you know, you can play the whole rollout game, but really honing in on what the, the bigger picture of this whole running piece of life is. And to me, it's to be able to do it every day. Almost every day. I need rest days. I know that. <laughs> that's, such a, that's such a good answer. Um, so, Sean, do you have any feedback on that? Yeah. So, if the race is imminent, then it's game time. And how well I know the athlete doesn't matter. How well they know themselves is all that matters. Um, so, on top of what Chrissy said about what does this mean to them and 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 how important is it, um, it also is simply just to get them to have a conversation with themselves that's deep and open and honest, sort of in the vein of motivational interviewing, trying to find out why they're here, what, what they want to get out of it. But I have often, though, found that athletes with injuries, even ones that have been chronic, the injury that they're most worried about when they get to the race doesn't come up, and it's something else that goes wrong in the race. Um, so I might add that little tidbit of information for them to think about, but... Um, it, it needs to be them. And I think that by working with an athlete over time to get them to know and understand themselves very well, not only their motivations, but their body, their intuition becomes more and more useful in that situation. And, and I completely agree with that, that it's very much about the runner getting to know their own body as well as possible. And that's one of the key skills that I'm always encouraging my runners to think about. So when they, uh, when they see a doctor, when they have training, when they have races, when they have uh, massage or foam rolling, each and every one of these things is giving them an idea about how their body feels, how it reacts to things, how things are changing. So they're always more aware of, of any little things that uh, may be different, why that might be. And they, they're constantly getting to know how their body works better. Because I completely agree with, with what you guys have said, which is it's a very difficult question to answer. And I actually have exactly this scenario with a runner who has a marathon this weekend. Last weekend, she picked up some kind of injury. She hasn't run for a few days. She's really upset that at the moment she might not get to do the marathon, but should be okay. It doesn't seem to be that serious. The physio doesn't seem to think it's that bad. But the question is, how well do you know your own body? Also, it's, you've got a few days potentially to just be walking around, getting a sense of how your body is improving and changing. Uh, and the other thing that definitely comes down to it is how important is the race? So if that is someone and it's the Olympics and it's probably their one shot at the Olympics, I'd almost say, you know, run through almost anything because that might be your one 
golden moment of your entire career. While for most of us, not every race is a once in a lifetime chance. So you, you don't have quite that same trade off. But I, I agree with what Chrissy said, which is you want to do this for the long term. So don't take big risks. Um, another thing that comes into it about knowing the individual is are they the kind of person who would be smart? And if they can tell in the early miles that the injury is it, it is an injury, and it's not a good idea to keep running, that they would stop or would they just finish the race regardless? And that would could be a big part of my advice to them of whether they should start it or not, if they're not feeling perfect at the start line. That's so helpful, thank you. Well, we need Sean's question. I just have one thing, like, I feel like I'm doing my job if I'm putting myself out of work because of what you just said, Ian, that the, helping people become so Definitely. aware of the, that they don't need a coach anymore. So like, you shouldn't have to stay with me for ever and ever and ever. We should like be able to help. Anyways, I, it's kind of a funny way to to think about your own work, right? <laughs> Sean, your turn. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? In the future, we should come back to a to topic that you've made me think of there, Chrissy, which, which is about how how elite athletes sometimes will have you know have a the same coach even for their entire mm -hmm. career, or certainly people at the very upper echelon who know themselves arguably better than anybody else possibly could. You know, they have coaches, and their relationship is different than typically we would have with our average athlete, but. Um, but anyway, interesting topic. So my true false for each of you is running more miles in training leads to better 100 mile race performance. And I think maybe we've, we've come around to David. I'm gonna say false um, with caveat that you have to reach a certain threshold that varies by each person. Um, so maybe let's say like, I mean, you know, Claire Gallagher, that might be 45 miles a week because she's ridiculously talented for other people. It might be 70 or whatever, 90 even if they're, but like, it's not just a more is better thing, especially in hundred milers. I would actually go as far to say that in marathons and road marathons, I would bet there's more of a correlation than there would be in hundred milers past that threshold because, um, in hundred, all right. So in road marathons, you're really getting the hardcore limits on aerobic threshold and how fast that is and how efficient that is. So every little ounce of aerobic development you can get, which is pr the primary thing you're going to get from extra mileage, really comes into play. Um, for 100 milers, so many more variables come in that we've talked about on this podcast throughout, but like maybe one of the biggest ones is one, yeah, aerobic efficiency matters, but then also your um, ability to withstand the distance, your recovery status and freshness and stress levels and motivation and all those mental things really start to matter more. So I, for hundred milers, I almost always try to keep athletes at a lower volume than I do for athletes that are trying to like, that are like, I would say that the Olympic trials qualifiers that I coach are usually 20 to 30% higher overall volume than the hundred mile or mile people. Um, and a lot of that's just because for the hundred mile people, I want them to be able to nail some long runs, some prep races, but the weekly five mile double on a Tuesday or whatever doesn't seem to play as big of a role in outcomes long term. Um, but again, I might be measuring, you know, noise in that signal um, or interpreting noise as signal there. So I would say uh, don't emphasize miles to their, you know, yeah. it matters, but it's not the most important thing. Uh, I'm also kind of in between there. So I would say all other things being equal, yes, running more miles will be better, but the odds are that other things won't be equal. So if you go from 50 miles to 100 miles a week, there's going to be a whole lot of other things like how you recover. You might not be able to get the same quality into the speed sessions. So I would always rather say we, we go up to the point with anyone I'm coaching where they're still able to do good quality speed sessions. And so for some, uh, for 100 mile, definitely there's a, a higher threshold of the mileage you have to do just to be able to get through it. But for some that might be 40 or 50 miles a week. Uh, and we're still trying to make sure they can have some faster running in there. For some, it's obviously gonna be a lot higher than that. Um, for me personally, and for a lot of people I've seen in this sport who've lasted a long time, it's often more like 70 miles a week being easily enough to, to perform at the top level of, uh, of 100 mile distance. Uh, and so that is a very low number when you compare to road marathoners. But also bear in mind that it's more about time than just distance. So if you're doing 70 miles a week and 20,000 feet of climbing and a load of that's hiking and that's actually 15 hours a week, that's very different to doing 120 miles a week at a six minute mile average or something, you know, that, uh, for a top level marathoner. So uh, a lot of it more is about 
time than distance when you think about trails and mountains and particularly 100 miles um, and also because you'll have more hiking within the training for that to be uh, to be effective i'd actually say um a big part of it is in thinking of it in, I kind of think of it in two types of mileage. So there's the running and the hiking mileage, uh, and just the longer the distance of the race, the more that skews towards hiking mileage. But you can add a lot of extra hiking, and it's easy on the body because it's more like active recovery. It's much less pounding. Um, so you could probably add on many more hours per week of training if most of that is hiking versus running. Uh, and so that side of it becomes more relevant, but it's still not about just getting the most you possibly can. It's about getting that balance right so that you can still firstly enjoy it overall, and secondly, um, not be getting injured and be keeping the quality in the speed sessions. Yeah. Um, I Actually, I wrote down true with the big caveat, as long as your body is adapting, because I, um, I, I do feel like having that time on feet um, maybe like back-to-back -back days where you're training your body to get back out there again. Like you were saying, Sean, like those multiple times when we were talking about the 200 mile training, those multiple times a day of what that does for your like psyche in terms of how are you ready for running a hundred miles. But that big caveat is as long as your body's adapting, I know personally, I don't do well much over 70 miles a week. Like I start to get into breakdown mode so I can manage a couple of those like big weeks like later in the training and one and then big recovery after. Uh, and I've seen that with other people. And then I've seen people that can just like take away big miles. So again, it comes back to the individual and what they're able to accommodate. Um, so overtraining is real. Your body needs to be adapting. And I, with the hundred mile thing, like getting in more miles, a lot of times that's over years. So it might not be in this like cram session of, I want to train for my first hundred miler. It's, what is your experience in the last three to five years leading up to this 100 miler and keeping those miles in mind as we think about how many more miles are we running to train for a 100 miler? So maybe if you haven't run a 50K yet, you can think of those those miles leading up to being part of that bigger um, 100 mile goal. Fantastic stuff. I, I'm going to maybe follow up with a question if I can with that maybe hopefully pulls in a, a bunch of what all of you have said and present a scenario that somebody is doing, let's say 60 miles a week, 60 miles a week. They're training for trail, you know, a trail race, trail hundred miler, maybe not huge mountain, but you know, runnable, but trails. And they are not breaking down. They're feeling okay. And they have the time to put in to do extra. How do they know how much more they should do, or even if they should do more at all. And getting to what Ian was talking about, time and distance, is there any idea or any thought that there, the benefit would be getting more miles, so maybe do them like on road or flat, versus get more on trails, even if they're slower? Um, oh, this is me. I get first dibs. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question. I guess I'm going to contradict myself a little bit. So I'll say that if this athlete, I'll frame it as the trial of miles. Like if this athlete has never um, in a concerted way trained up, like, like an elite athlete, you know, at, at the top level, adding as much aerobic volume as they possibly can in the context of their lives that is meaningful and happy and healthy, um, then doing it this time it's the only way to see if you're a responder and then that might be the key to your ultimate breakthrough. Um, you know, an example is this guy named, um, amazing athlete named Ben Robinson ran in college, um, but never really did that many miles. Um, was like two thirty type marathon guy, which is very fast, but, um, you know, this year that he had time and I was just like, let's do the trial of miles and similar athletes, 60 miles a week, bumped it up to, you know, 85, 90, 100 with doubles, all that thing. Um, and, you know, at CIM this coming, like in a couple of weeks, like he's, he's going to be right on that, you know, 217 cusp or so. And it's pure. And I mean, his volume, his intensity probably decreased a little bit. So I would say increasing volume is, is an experiment that I think everyone, every athlete that wants to explore their potential needs to do at some point, but not to ignore the signals. So um, it is not an end in and of itself. It's just a means to get your body to turn on possibly some genetic switches, possibly other things. Um, so I would say for that 60 mile per week person, like start by adding some easy doubles, possibly some like 
um, maybe some overall volume. Don't add intensity. Um, see where that takes you. Pay attention to your body. Eat a ton and um, go from there. So I contain many contradictions apparently, but that's what I would say. So Ian, what do you think? Uh, it's a tough one. I, I mean, I would say for that exact scenario, when you're trying to decide how much more do you do? And if so, which direction does that go? Uh, I would say doing a little bit more running and ideally making that running be a little bit more specific. So if it's a trail 100 miler, maybe trying to spend a little bit more time on the trails to get those extra miles, but still keeping in things like speed work and some of the flatter running. Um, I'd also say that on top of that, you could add in um, as much hiking as you have time for. So definitely, if that person is trying to take you to another level, a little bit more running is a good first step. Not too much of a risk if they go from you know, 60 to 65, 70, see how their body reacts to that. Um, and in addition to that, maybe if they have loads of extra time, bumping it up more with the hiking side of things. That's always the way I would bias it. For a 100 miler, that'd be different if it was a shorter race or a more runnable race. Um, but there's not too much risk in doing that as long as it's 60 miles, they seem to be coping with it well. They're not getting injuries popping up. They're not feeling tired half the time. Um, but I wouldn't say, well, you've got an extra 10 hours a week. So add on an extra 50 miles because that's, you know, that, that's going to be fairly suicidal to do that. But they could add on potentially quite a lot of that time doing hiking and it would be fairly low risk. When you asked that question, I had this like all these alarm bells going off for this athlete that has more time and like they just want to fill it with running. I, I That just makes me like nervous for that because like, I want them to have like the ability to have other balance in their life. So that was my initial response was like, no, don't, don't. But like, I do think the trial of miles, I, what you um, detailed out there, David, I thought was really like a good point in terms of like seeing what you're capable of and, and acknowledging if you have this block in time in life, that this is what we're focusing on. And it can, it can consume a bit more of the, the week than maybe if you were working a full-time job or whatever allows you to have this extra time. Um, eating right on. If you're adding miles that like you've got to compensate in fueling would be a big part of that. And then just the one thing I haven't heard you guys say was then how would you also use that time for more recovery? So if you're going to add miles, and I know we've all talked about it before and how important that part is of training. So I just want to add it to this part of the conversation is you, yes, go ahead, try this trial of miles, add on some time, but also be really strategic about not getting to the point where you're like tapped and then have to recover by like, work the recovery in along the way so that that adaptation can happen. Yeah. So it's two. The only other thing I add in since is age is a, plays a big role in this. You know, if we're talking about a hypothetical 25 year old athlete, it's very different than talking about, you know, athletes that might be like, let's even, I mean, 55, for example, like all of the data I've seen behind the scenes, like the, very rarely are there volume responders, you know, above 50. And so, you know, between those two, like a lot of it depends on the specific backgrounds of those individuals. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a, like the more that I see, the more I'm like individual response rates are so crazy different. And whether I, you know, because Megan, my wife is, is so heavily involved in genetics and genetic research, I come always come back to that because it's like the easy genetics, um, answer, but who knows what it is. And so like getting back to what the other coaches have said, like I would really think about how you respond and don't necessarily try to analogize to other athletes so much um, because, you know, their experiences and background, like the same thing that's incredibly productive for an athlete that seems the same might be um, not just counterproductive, but the type of thing that causes long-term regression. So it's the fun of all this. Um, and I guess it's why, you know, coaches have jobs. So Sean, yeah, I mean, um, I'd love you to finish off with like some of your thoughts on that issue, if you're comfortable with that. I am, Not but the you, age thing, but the issue generally. Well, the age thing though is, I think, is important. It's something we didn't talk about when we talked about tweaks. You know, you've all probably heard that that statement of getting old is not for wimps. And and I mean, that's the truth. So you're not going to find a, a 55 and 60 year old runner who doesn't just live with aches and pains and tweaks and strains and other things. So um, the perspective on on what you do when you're having those things, um, I think, changes a lot and shifts with age. So knowing your body, which is what we already said. Um, yeah, for me, I mean, the reason that I presented this as a true false is because it's I, I think it's a very tricky situation on the edge of a slippery slope. Um, because more 
running, I think, does tend to help endurance performance for everybody, but to greater and lesser degrees. And um, your observation there, David, of, of just, Andy, and actually you've all really said this, that if, as long as you're not, and that's why I put it in there, as long as you're not getting injured and you're feeling fresh on the miles you're doing, then clearly you have space and you have room to try more. But that doesn't necessarily mean that more is going to do you better, even if you can handle it fine. So in trying those extra miles, don't just ask the question of, am I not getting injured now? I mean, the question needs to be, are my paces increasing or am I, you know, am I improving in some other ways that I want to improve? Um, because being out is something we all love doing. And so more time, more miles is lovely. And if that's what it's for, that's great. But if it's really just performance then you're looking at, then in some respects, we want to, we want to find the, the minimal amount of work for the maximum gain. I love the way Christy framed it in terms of adaptation. Um, like, I think that that's the big thing to think about in general for all these topics is that adaptation happens in the empty spaces and feeling good is good. Like it's something to really embrace because that's, those are the athletes that do progress long-term. It takes a, I mean, this is another statement that everyone won't agree to. So I want to caveat that necessarily that's listening, but I almost never see adaptation happen through states of high fatigue unless an athlete is a freakish talent. Um, and so there's all these stories of marathoners being like, oh, well, if you're able to get up out of bed, you're not training hard enough. Or like, you know what I mean? That, that glorifies this hard training that does work for them. But my guess is that it's partially because they've been selected as the type of people that do respond to that. One of the, you throw a dozen eggs at the wall, the one that doesn't break thinks that all eggs can get thrown against the wall. Um, so I would just say like, if you feel good at 5 PM, you can just go eat dinner and chill. You don't have to go for another run necessarily. Um, but that gets back to the complications of it all. You know, this brings our, our 2019 for Coaches Corners to a close. And maybe we do have a few more minutes, I think, um, unless anybody needs to go. So you know, at this point, let's, let's, let's free for all. And if anybody has follow-up stuff or want us to talk about something else, let's go for it. I have one little follow-up about the mileage there. <clears throat> one thing that I think a lot of runners get hung up on is getting round numbers like, oh, I, I'm at 58 miles this week, but I wanted to hit 60. And it's asking yourself, are you getting those two miles for the sake of just hitting a number or because it's going to make you fitter? So when we talk about doing more running, um, especially as people do more, it's like, okay, well, I've been doing 60 miles a week every week, so if I can do 70, then I'm going to feel so much better. And it's more psychological that they're thinking it's going to help than that there's any physical need to go from 69 to 70 just for the sake of it. So they go out and you know add one extra mile just to hit that number, particularly around the number 100, either 100 kilometers per week or 100 miles a week, because that, that's such a big psychological difference for people. So always ask yourself, you know, why are you getting those extra miles in? Is it because uh, it's actually gonna make you fitter or are you just trying to hit a round number and actually your body saying you've done enough for now, you need to recover and you'd be better going for a walk? It could be just a discrepancy of a watch. Like my watch said 13 and her watch said 14. She already got the mile and I didn't. Right. So anyway, I, that's where I push back, like on those little miles. I'm like, come on. Like, we didn't even know what, how many miles we were necessarily running 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And we didn't have these fancy watches. <laughs> I do a little, little mental cartwheels when I see an athlete, I say that maybe it's supposed to do a uh, run for 12 miles and they and their run comes in and it's done at 11.9 or when it's supposed to be you know two hours and they're done at an hour 58 that they don't feel like they have to just run around the car or or, or jump up and down to get that last little bit i think that's the sign of a, a mature runner and i think we all sometimes don't do that i have to admit i've done well, like I just go one more round <laughs> the block just to make that the round number that's true <laughs> Uh, well, this, I would uh, try, I guess, my wrap up of just this has been an awesome year to see our own evolution in the Coach's Corner podcast and like getting to meet with you guys monthly and a little bit of mushy factor there. But I just I really enjoy that we're doing this and we've got a, some new ideas and fun stuff going into 2020 and that mainly like, we get to keep doing it. So it's cool that the there's an audience support and people are interested and we can keep going and evolving this part too. So thanks for making the time and making a commitment to it because it takes a little bit to get that habit going. I feel, feel like we've all prioritized it, which is 
feels great. And as we go into 2020, we probably will have more episodes that tackle m more topics somewhat ish like we did we did today. And so there's all the more room for listener questions. Um, so anybody who's wanting to have a question answered, just email them to me, Sean at scienceofultra.com. Um, Sean is S-H-A-W-N. Or through the website, you can easily use the contact form there and send us some of your topics, your questions. It no longer has to be in the form of a true false. And we'll, um, we'll hopefully get to them in the new year. Thanks, Evan. I second exactly what Chrissy just said. I find it really useful for me personally. And I know that a lot of people I coach uh, listen to it and, and they find it good just to prod different ideas in different ways. David, wrap us up. Well, I think two things. One, I think one of the big lessons from this year is that there are multiple ways to do things. So don't judge yourself if you're listening to this and you don't do something that we say, like if you're a 10 mile per week person, like you can still grow a ton off that. And we've all seen that as coaches, you know? Um, so we're, we're talking about hypotheticals here, but just know that like where you are is, is the perfect place to be. And from there you can grow or, and just within the context of a life that's meaningful for you. Um, and I think if anyone's playing the drinking game at home of where I say that, you can probably take a shot now. Um, and then two is just how, how thankful we all are. We've talked about this for, for anyone that listens to this. Um, it means a lot to us. And, you know, we've talked a lot offline about, about that. So thanks to the coaches and thanks to everyone for listening. You're freaking awesome. And in 2020, we're going to turn it up with something different. Well, it sounds like we'll be doing drinking games for, for next year. <laughs> we're going to get huge numbers. It's going to be awesome. Fantastic. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, guys.